And so I don't know how to get back and add a course ID now. All right, so you, uh, where it says, when you first log in to Jones and Bartlett, you should see a button that says redeem code. If you click accept, it'll bring you to another button that says redeem access code. So in that access code area, try putting the ID code there and see if that works. That should fix your problem. If not, let me know, and then I will um, we'll get technical support to help you. Is the one that starts with navigate, navigate the only one we're supposed to? So the navigate will put you into the TCD course. So that code is the 42C54A. And what that does is um, that brings up just our specific class, but it, it also gives you the ability to take your quizzes and tests. The, the first code you, could in, you put in for the book is the is the all gives you all of the options that the book offers but it doesn't actually put you in our emt class it's kind of confusing because there's two different codes um but with this particular course you could have one code but not the other so we chose to um to go with the option of having both and I'm, I apologize if I'm not explaining it too clearly, but we can work one-on-one -on -one to help you get into that. I'll have IT department uh, contact you if that, if that doesn't work. Any other questions? Everybody in the, uh, the JB Learning, everybody in the Navigate. The quiz is open. So the quiz in Navigate is open. It opened at five o'clock this morning and it'll stay open um, through midnight tomorrow is when it closes. If you're unable to log on, you're still having problems tomorrow, we can extend the quiz, keeping it open, um, seeing it's the, it's the first one and we're trying to you know, navigate our way through this. Um, Where would you see the quiz? So when you get in to navigate, when you click launch, if you click under chapter one EMS systems, and let me let me share my screen so you guys can all see this. Can you guys see my screen where it says Premier Access Emergency Care Transportation of Sick and Injured 11E? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so if you click on Chapter 1 here, EMS Systems, that's going to bring you into just our course material. So it's going to give you the option to have the learning objectives, the ebook, Chapter 1. And what's kind of cool with this ebook, Chapter 1, is that um, you can click on the button that says audio and it will read it to you. So that's kind of a cool function if you want to have that. Lecture one chapter, audio book. So this is just audio. It has no pictures, nothing for you to read. It's just for you to listen if that's how you're, you know, that's what kind of learner you are. It's got flashcards. So if you're the type of learner that likes to use flashcards, this has got electronic flashcards you can use. There's slides, all kinds of things. But if you come down to the bottom, that gives you chapter one quiz. Click on chapter one quiz, and then it'll tell you this quiz opened at Thursday, 5 a.m., so today at 5 a.m., and it closes tomorrow at midnight. 
So then all you have to do is click attempt quiz and then you can you can take the quiz. Um, it automatically grades it right after you're done taking the quiz. Um, so you'll have immediate feedback on how you did. And then I see the grades on my end. So I take the grades from this program and then I put it into our TCD school program, which is SDS. Now that's the SDS is the program that you will be able to see your grades. You will be able to log on and see your grade in real time. So you can see what you're getting. So homework grades go in there, quizzes and exams. So you can see if you've got an, over an 80% or it'll calculate what your percentage is. Um, and then, you know, kind of kind of let you know where you're at per minute. So the other thing that with this is your parents all have access to the TCD grading book. So they can log on to SDS under their parent connect and then they can see your grades real time. So if you're looking at your grades on JB Learning, on this, if you're looking at your grades here, that's not gonna be a, a true calculation of your grade because this is just a snapshot of your grade. If you want your true grade, you have to look in SDS. Clear as mud? Yeah. All right. Um, I know there was another email that was put out about, um, you know, if anybody, anybody needs any extra help getting into JB Learning, getting into Navigate, uh, because that's where you guys are going to be taking your quizzes and exams while we're doing remote. So if you got that email, there's a couple Zoom meetings that are, that are going to be scheduled. Um, if you can make one of those, that's great if you're having a, a problem. Um, and then if you're also a student that, um, that needs extra help, um, get in contact with that email also and, um, and, and you'll be assisted, all right? So how we're gonna communicate is through Schoology and then through Remind. That's how we're gonna communicate with each other. The good thing about Remind is you guys fill it out. So when I'm communicating with you, it acts as a um, text message but I'm not seeing your guys' phone numbers and you're not seeing my phone number. So it's through the, it's through the third party app. That's the only reason why we have to use Remind. This is, is, is really gonna be important when you guys start doing your clinical time in January because you will be going to the hospital, you'll be going to the private ambulance company or the uh, fire department and you're, you're on your own. So I will be available during the times you're in clinical, but again, it's, it's through the Remind app. So that's why it's so important. I got to get everybody in that. You guys should see the Schoology uh, page now, correct? Yeah. Okay. So when you guys log into Schoology, you guys, um, the first page you see is updates. So this is the upcoming assignments. And here is all of the lecture codes. We're, Lieutenant Danelli and I are trying to put up those codes the night before. So you guys see them. And it doesn't matter to us which class you want to take. If you guys can make the morning class because of your schedules, work, home life, make the morning class. If you can make the afternoon class, make the afternoon class. But please try and make every effort to, to make one of the live classes every day. I know your homeschools have different schedules. They're kind of crazy right now. Um, but really, our course is, is five days a week. And I don't want to see any of you guys fall behind, OK? So you guys are doing great, logging in every day, getting the live lectures. Um, but if you can't make it that day, not a problem. You can log in and take your attendance. So make sure you're doing your attendance every day between 5 in the morning and 1.15 in the afternoon. You just go in. You click that you're here. You take your attendance. And then you can do what you got to do. If you got to go to your homeschool, go to your homeschool. If you got to go to work or whatever the case may be. But then please find some time. And it could be in the evening. It could be whenever to get your EMT work done. So the video we're taping now, um, this will be posted. You will be able to watch it. So on Schoology, you can watch the videos from seven days when they're posted. And then they, they go away. However... We are dual taping our lectures, so you can go to my YouTube channel and the lectures will always be there 
from the start of class to the end of class. All right. So you can watch the live lecture um, through JB Learning. You have a lot of information that you can access. Right. So you've got the book, you've got um, all kinds of things to assist you. And then we're available between eight o'clock and three thirty Monday through Friday. We are I'm, I'm in class right now. And we're available for you guys to ask questions. You can use the Remind app. You can call me here in the office. You can send an email. Um, so we're here for you guys five days a week. All right. And again, you know, we met with your parents last night, and it was a great meeting. Had a great meeting with your parents and explained everything to them because we just want to make sure we're we're keeping up to to date with all of our out minimum hour, hours that are required and all of our material that has to be completed because at the end of the day we want to get you guys your a or b high school grade we want to get you guys 11 credits towards your associate's degree at the junior college and we ultimately we want to get you guys licensed as emts and get you guys into the profession to start working so you guys got to work with us you got to put in some effort we're going to put in the effort for you and then we'll we'll get through this now, again, everything we're going over, everything we're doing with all these apps, these computer programs and all this, we're only doing this because we're remote. So when you guys are sitting here in class and I get to look at you, this all kind of goes away. All right. So we just got to get through this while we're doing remote learning. Uh, we just got to get this uh, virus to calm down and and uh, everybody can get back to talking to each other. All right. So bear with us, make sure you stay dynamic, make sure you stay fluid, and um, we'll get through this. On the right side here, you're gonna see um, the upcoming assignment. So here's your check-in. This is the parent-student agreement. So I went over this last night with all of your parents. So your responsibility is to please print that out for them. And then I need you to sign that last page that you and your parents agree to the syllabus. And then you could take a picture of that, upload it back to me, that goes in your file. So I'd like that by Monday, the end of you know midnight on Monday. Um, so if you can get that done between now and over the weekend, get that signed and turned back to me. You see Lieutenant Danelli put down here ISO 100, Instant Command System. That was, not, it's a not graded assignment. It's an assignment that is good to know, nice to know information. But again, that's an assignment that um, is not graded. You're, there's no grade for that. When you go to materials, when you click on your, your page and go to materials, that's when you're going to see the, the course content. So chapter one is highlighted. That means it's open. You guys can click it. So again, in here, you've got the PowerPoint. You've got the vocabulary. You've got the case study, which we're going to go over today. You've got the learning objectives, the chapter lecture. There's your homework, how to scan it in. Um, so this is all the material that uh, that is in this folder. So when you're working remote on your own, there's a lot of things that you can access to make sure you succeed and get all the information for that chapter. When you come down here to the bottom or middle page, I guess it would be, you've got these three folders here. This is the agreement. If you still need to print that out and sign it with your parents, that's FIRE 2271 DC 101 2020 agreement. The other two folders that are above it, you've got the FIRE 2271 DC 101 and 102 schedule. These schedules are identical. The difference is 101 is the AM class, 102 is the PM class. So if you click on that, not a bad idea to print this out, keep it somewhere at home. This is your schedule. So there's no surprises. Um, you have your schedule from now until May 21st. You will know when every chapter is due. You will know when quizzes are due. You will know when your exams are due. Um, it's all right here and it's all spelled out. Now, again, you know, we can, we have flexibility to modify this a little bit if, if we need to. Uh, but for the most part, this is going to be what we're going to stick to. And we have to stick to the schedule because first semester, we have to do 21 chapters completed. And then second semester, we have to do 21 chapters completed. So it's a lot of material um, to be, to be completed. That's why we got to stay on track. All right. So you can see here, uh, chapter 20, chapter one is 826 through 828. So if you look on your schedule here on 828 at the last day of that chapter, your homework is due. If you turn in your homework before midnight on the due date, you get 
full credit, which is 50 points. So every homework assignment is worth 50 points. Homework assignments are 10% of your overall grade. If you turn in your homework late, if it's after the deadline, you get half credit. So you will get 25 points out of 50. So it, it's important to get your homework in on time, okay? Get your full credit, get your 10%. Also on the 28th, you will see the last day on the, on the schedule that that is when the quiz is gonna be, is gonna open up. So we're gonna open up the quiz at five in the morning on the 28th, and we're gonna close it at midnight the next day. So you're gonna have almost two days to complete your online quiz. Quizzes are always 20 questions, and that's 20% of your overall grade. Then you see here on 928 and 929, we will review, we will do skills, hopefully if you are in class. If you're still not in class by then, we, we will do demonstrations, but then you will, you will be taking your first exam. Your first exam number one, is gonna be due by 9.29 at midnight, chapters one through six and chapter eight. Your exams are 50 questions. Your exams are 70% of your overall grade. So 70, 20, 10. You cannot retake any exams or any quizzes. So once you hit submit, there are no retakes. You have to maintain an 80% or greater overall with homework, quizzes, and exams to be passing this class. So everybody has to get an A or a B to be able to sit for your NREMT licensure exam, to be eligible for your 11 semester hours of college credit. Now, if you're under that 80%, you will still pass the class. You will pass the class with your high school grade. High school grade for passing is a D or better. So you have to get at least a D to get your high school grade, okay? Questions, comments, or concerns about the schedule, grading, or any of, of that? We're good? Mm-hmm. All right, guys, I also have Miss Lardino here, and um, she's going to be assisting our class throughout the year if you guys need any extra help. So I'm going to let her introduce herself and talk. Hi, guys. I don't know if I can see myself. Hi, I'm the new SSA for this program. Um, I'm actually new here, so I'm kind of diving in along with you guys with this new experience. Um, if you guys need any extra help, if you need any guidance, I might not have the exact answer, but I promise I can try to help you navigate and find it. I know things are a little confusing right now, but just it's going to be okay. Um, also, I sent an email out to a few students that are already on my list that need a little extra help. Um, and I've scheduled a couple Zoom meetings today and tomorrow to help you guys get into your books. If you feel like you need help getting in, logged into your books, please contact me on Schoology and I can invite you into that Zoom meeting. Um, I'm added as an instructor on your Schoology, so you'll see me right there. And um, you could just message me directly on there. That's probably the easiest way to do it. And I'll see it right away. I check it um, regularly. Um, but like I said, if you need help with anything, if I don't have the answer, I will help try to navigate this with you guys. Okay, have a great day. So how cool is that? You've got myself, Lieutenant Tinelli, Ms. Lardino, so we got, you know, we got options. We can uh, try and navigate this all together, okay? You guys have anything else before we dive into a case study? That's the, that's the fun stuff.
Sounds good. All right, we're going to dive into our case study. Can you guys all see that? Chapter one EMS case study. Can you guys all see that? No. Okay. I Stand don't by. see anything. Can you see that now? No. No. All right, can you guys see it? Yeah. All right, excellent. Yeah. So we have we're going to go through one of the case studies here. And then after we get done with the case study, um, there's a video that goes along with this case study. And then we'll wrap up the day, give you some more time to finish up your homework and get ready for your quiz uh, today and tomorrow. All right. So this is where we're going to talk to each other. So I need you guys to interact. There is no right or wrong answer. So I just want to get you guys with these case studies. We're starting to get some critical thinking going on. All right. So here's the scenario. You are a recently certified EMT. You and your partner, which is a paramedic, are dispatched to a possible heart attack at 200 South 12th Avenue. As you get into the ambulance, the dispatcher announces CPR is in progress. You're excited at the thought of working your first cardiac arrest and possibly saving a patient's life. So when you hear CPR in progress, we know that somebody is doing chest compressions and somebody is breathing for the person because they do not have a pulse and they do not have any breathing. En route to the location, you and your partner discuss what roles you will play to assist each other in expediting defibrillation, airway management, intravenous access, and pharmacologic therapies. You feel ready to tackle all the tasks the paramedic has placed in your charge and feel confident as a member of the pre-hospital team. How would you define a real emergency? What's a real emergency to you? When someone's life is at risk. Excellent answer. Good. What else? Isn't um when they say CPR is in progress, it's one of the worst things. Or like everyone's like mind kind of changes. Kind of like it's one of the worst calls. I don't know. I thought I heard something like that. Is that CPR is one of the worst ones in progress? You are absolutely correct. So in EMS, the worst call for the patient that you could go on is cardiac arrest. That's when the person has no breathing, no pulse, and by definition, they are dead. So yeah, that is absolutely the worst call you can go on. You guys will be going on calls where, you know, possible fractures or medical emergencies, asthma attacks, um, allergic reactions, or car accidents where people are hurt and traumas. But yeah, the cardiac arrest call is going to be the worst, worst case that you can go on. So how about this? How about, so um, if I call 911, what if I stubbed my toe on the, the chair and it's, it's throbbing, it's hurting really bad, but I call 911 because I think that, that this is, this is really bad and it's the worst that I've ever felt. And to me, that's a real emergency. So keep that in mind too, that people in our, our residents and community, when they call 911, 
that means that it's a real emergency to them. However, when you get there and you say, sir, you just stubbed your toe. I don't believe it's fractured. I, it's not bleeding. Uh, you're able to walk. So we can kind of step back, take our time, do a good assessment, make sure the scene is safe, wear our proper PPE and BSI. But to that person, that stub toe is a real emergency. But to us in the EMS world, would you say that the stub toe is a lot far less important than the full arrest? Yeah. Absolutely. But however, that stub toe may be a real emergency for that person. So we treat everyone as if it's a real emergency. Now, where this comes into play is how we categorize it. So at your level, at the EMT level, you can handle any call that is basic life support. So stub toe is basic life support. Two EMTs will be able to handle that call. For the full arrest, that is an advanced life support call. Anything, any call that you guys go on that you can't handle as EMTs because of your scope of practice, you need to then call for help and call for ALS. So every call you guys go on, you're going to make sure the scene is safe, make sure you have proper PPE or BSI on. You will then start your assessment and make a determination right away. Can I handle this as two EMTs on my ambulance, BLS, or do I need a paramedic and call the ALS? So great. Question number two, in the overall scheme of pre-hospital medicine, what are the primary roles and responsibilities of you as an EMT? What are we responsible for? I know we covered it yesterday in the lecture. What are you going to be responsible for as the EMT? Uh, performing a patient assessment. Excellent. Outstanding. Assessment. How about, um, how about just checking out the vehicle and making sure the vehicle is ready to respond? Making sure that all of our equipment is checked out and ready to, to go. What about knowing what our area is to respond to? That's your primary role, right? Your PSA, primary service area. So we got to know where we're going. Assessment. What else? Being an advocate for the pa patient. Outstanding. Being a patient advocate. What else? Making sure staying calm and safe for like you and your partner. Staying calm, being safe. Absolutely. Making sure the scene is safe. Um, if you get a call for a domestic and you arrive and police are not on the scene, but you hear yelling, broken glass if you hear you know fight going on you're not going to enter that scene you and your partner got to stay safe so you're going to stay out you're going to stage until police arrive when the police secure that scene then you guys can go in and treat the patient excellent you guys will have to determine what treatments to give so through your assessment we're going to teach you guys how to be detectives i know we're not in class to be police officers However, as EMTs, you do have to do some investigation. So you're going to take what dispatch is telling you. You're going to take what the patient is telling you. And you've got to be that detective and decide what's wrong with the person and then how can I treat this person. So if the person is telling you I'm having a hard time breathing and you listen to their lung sounds and they're having wheezing and the patient tells you I have a history of asthma, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. So that person is probably having an asthma attack. So at that point, you would turn to your SOP that says asthma, and we're just going to follow that SOP and just make sure that we do our right treatments and, and then help the patient. So these are all things that, you know, these are going to be your primary role. There's a lot of them. There's about 14 of them. But those are hitting just, you know, the, the highlights. All right. As you arrive on this scene and pull into the driveway, you notice a law enforcement officer's vehicle and a pickup truck with a red rotating beacon on the roof. 
used by responders from the volunteer fire department. When you and your partner enter the house, you find a police officer and firefighter on either side of the patient. So that's who's performing CPR. You've got a police officer and a firefighter. The police officer states he was the first one on the scene, which is very typical, and immediately started CPR. He's going to follow the American Heart Association guidelines. He's going to do 30 chest compressions and then two breaths, and he's going to put the AED on the patient, the automatic external defibrillator. So after the firefighter arrived, he applied an AED to the patient and successfully administered a shot. So the AED is a device that you guys are going to be carrying on your ambulance that will allow you to defibrillate or shock a patient that is in a lethal rhythm. Now, the difference between AED and cardiac monitor is the AED is used by EMRs, EMTs, AEMTs, and paramedics. The cardiac monitor is only used by paramedics because we are trained at a higher level to be able to read and identify the heart rhythms and act accordingly. So you guys put your AED on, it shocks. The patient now has a carotid pulse. If you come down in, into your neck, into the groove of your neck on either side is your carotid pulse. And we'll teach you this later on and how to feel for that pulse. But if you just kind of feel on your own neck, you'll, you'll start to feel your, your own pulse. So that's what we check on the patient. So this patient initially had no pulse, no breathing. CPR was started. The patient was shocked and then now has a pulse. What are your immediate concerns regarding patient care and what are your overall responsibilities as an EMT at this point? What's our, our, what's our immediate concern with this patient? Um, to make sure that that pulse stays the same. Excellent. Yes, to make sure that that pulse stays and we don't lose it. What else? What about the breathing? What do we want to know about the breathing? Want to make sure he's still breathing? Outstanding, yeah. Is the patient breathing on their own or do I still need to breathe for them? Using what's called the bag valve mask, we'll teach you this later on. Um, there's a that, That's the tool, the device that we use to breathe for for our patients. So we may need to breathe for them. We may need to get them out of the house. So we may need to get him out of the house, onto the cot, and then into the ambulance. We want to make sure that we keep reassessing and, and we, we keep doing our treatments while we're en route to the hospital. So that's going to be your, your overall responsibility. The driver of the ambulance, your overall responsibility is to drive to the hospital, making sure that we're stopping at the red lights, making sure that we're using our lights and siren and make sure and you know that we're getting the crew and the patient there safe. So that's that's your primary responsibility. Because of the teamwork among you, the police officer and the firefighter and the paramedic, a cardiac rhythm has been successfully established. The patient has been intubated and an IV has been established to administer essential medications. So let's break this down. So you're working with a paramedic. There are some private ambulance services and ambulance fire departments that will allow an EMT to work with a paramedic. If that is the case, you as the EMT are gonna be responsible for setting up all of this advanced equipment. So you will be able to put on the cardiac monitor which we'll teach you guys how to do later on in class. You will put the leads on the patient and hook it up and turn it on. You will be expected to set up the intubation equipment so that the paramedic can intubate the person. That's where they put an endotracheal tube into their mouth and then it goes into their lungs so we can breathe for the person. You will also be um, expected to be able to start and, and set up the IV equipment. So you're going to spike the bag, put the tubing into the saline. You're going to get out the catheters. You're going to get out the start kit and have that ready for the paramedic. So you're, you're going to be the, the center to the quarterback, if you will. You're going to be there to get everything ready. And then the paramedic's going to do all the skills. 
You can do all the BLS skills though. You can do chest compressions. You can do ventilations. You can use the AED. You can use oxygen therapy. You can use a King airway. That's another airway device that if, if we can't get the patient intubated, that's a, a skill and a tool that you guys can use. And we'll show you how to use that later on in class and, and, and do that. So there's a lot you can do as an EMT to assist that paramedic. If you are, are on a private ambulance company or an ambulance service, and there's two EMTs, you are running a BLS ambulance that day. It's a basic life support ambulance. If you get the call for the person with a possible broken leg, that's a BLS call. You can handle that yourself. For this call though, it's ALS in nature because it's a full arrest. It's like the worst call you can, you can have. So we need to call ALS backup. So when you guys are doing your assessments, first thing you're gonna do is make sure the scene is safe, scene safety. Second, you have your PPE BSI on. Third, we're gonna do our, our quick primary assessment. And is this something I can handle at the BLS level or do I need to call for an ALS rig? If it's ALS, you just call for ALS backup, and then you will have a paramedic rig uh, respond. Questions, comments, concerns? All right, as you are preparing the patient for transport, a family member arrives and appears to be confused and very upset at what she sees. She explains that her father called for complaining of chest pain. She told him to rest while she called 911. So what's important about this? What's important about the daughter? Um, she was saying that he already had chest pain before this all happened. Good. So now we're, we're pretty confident that he went into full arrest because he's probably having a, a heart attack, right? So we're, that's good. What else do we see in there that, that kind of glares at us too? Couple things actually. Aren't the emotions of her seeing her dad having chest pains and calling 911, couldn't that play a role into it? Absolutely. So, you know, sometimes we need to break a member away from the resuscitative efforts to be with the, with the daughter because the daughter is going to be upset and she's going to need some emotional support too. Excellent. And then the last takeaway here is, so she told him to rest while she called 911. So we know, we know at the time she called 911, he was alive. So the state statute in Illinois to have an ambulance get to you is four to six minutes. So from the time you call 911 till the ambulance arrives, it should be about four to six minutes. So if you arrived in four to six minutes, you know that her dad went into full arrest about four to six minutes ago because he was talking to her on the phone. She called 911. So sometime between when she called 911 and you got there, that's when he went into full arrest. And what happens is he was complaining of chest pain prior to you getting there. When we have a heart attack, that's one of the signs that you're going to exhibit when you're having a heart attack. You're going to have chest pain, sweaty. You're going to have shortness of breath, arm pain, jaw pain, back pain. You're going to have all these signs that you could be having a heart problem. Well, depending on what artery in the heart is that's blocked, that's when the heart gets real irritable and then you go into full arrest. So we know one or more of his arteries are blocked and that's what caused chest pain and that's what caused the full arrest. So see how just in talking this scenario through, we're, we're, we're detectives, are we not? We're trying to piece all, these, all this information together quickly to be a critical thinker and then make decisions to help the patient. I have a question. Yes. Uh, when you said it was four to six minutes for an ambulance to get there, is it four to six minutes for like EMR in general or just an ambulance? So to answer your question, don't mistake 
EMR. EMR is a is a is a is a course that you take to get a license. So EMR is is the same thing as EMT. Now EMS, when you say you, you would say, how long does it take for EMS to work? Yeah, that's what I meant. EMS. Okay, so yes, in this in our in our state, the statute says when you call 911, you should have an ambulance arrive to you in four to six minutes. So that means that the fire department, the private ambulance companies, we have once that call comes in, we have 60 seconds to get out the door. So one minute, we should be moving to the ambulance, starting the ambulance, and starting to drive out. We have another five minutes, roughly, to get to that person. Now, the reason why that state statute is there and so important is because when a person goes into full arrest, time matters, right? So the textbook that you guys are reading, once you get to the CPR chapter, will tell you if a person goes into cardiac arrest and nobody does anything for them, they have four to six minutes before they start to become brain dead. So we looked at this through evidence-based research and said, you know what? If a person only has four to six minutes to survive once they collapse, if nobody helps them, we need to get ambulances there in that amount of time. So that's why the state statute says they give us four to six minutes to, to arrive. Now, what happens if it's the middle of winter and it's a blizzard and the roads are just terrible? Sometimes we can't get to people in four to six minutes. If the ambulance cannot get to you within four to six minutes, we have to write down in our patient care reports why we couldn't get to that person in four to six minutes. We would document weather, traffic. We would document whatever the case is that we couldn't get there in time. So that's why it's it's important that we do CPR classes to our public and, and we get into the public and do relations because you can see sometimes we just can't get to people fast enough. But the goal is to get to them within four to six minutes. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. How can you help the patient's daughter? So we talked about, you know, it was said the emotional part. So how can we how can we help the daughter? What are some things we can do? Um, could you tell her that like you got his pulse back? Absolutely. So what we should say to the patient. We should tell them the facts. So absolutely, your your dad is very sick. He most likely had a severe heart attack, which, which caused him to go into cardiac arrest. He has no pulse and no breathing. We are doing chest compressions. We are circulating his blood, and we are breathing for him. We are doing everything we can to resuscitate your dad. What you don't want to say is you don't want to ever lie to patients or exclude them. So if the daughter wants to watch the resuscitative effort, let the daughter watch the resuscitative effort. As long as the, as long as the daughter is not in the way of what is what is being done, let the daughter watch. Because that also helps with cope with death and dying. And we'll get into that in a later chapter. But, um, but that does help. If I, if I see you're doing everything for my dad, that's going to help me coping with, with it if my dad doesn't make it. But if I don't see what you guys are doing, there's always going to be that, did they do everything they could have? The other thing is you don't want to lie to people. So you don't want to tell people your dad is very sick and he went into cardiac arrest but he's going to make a full recovery. I know it. I know he's going to walk out of the hospital. We're going to do everything we can for him. Why is that not good to say to people? It gets their hopes up. Absolutely. You are the expert. You are the professional. So she's going to, she's going to listen to what you have to say and she's going to believe you because you are the expert. And then if her, and then if her dad doesn't make it, then She's going to be very upset because 
we give her false hope. So we, we, we don't want to give um, false hope. So just be honest. Give the facts. Where this comes into a little bit of a play is um, if you have a child. So say you have a 10-year-old child, and this was her dad, and her dad went into full arrest, um, and there's no other adult on the scene. Well, that gets a little tricky because you're not going to speak to a 10-year-old like you would an adult. However, you can tell that 10-year-old, your, your daddy is very sick, and we're helping him. We're doing everything we can to help him. We're going to take a ride in the ambulance. And then we also carry stickers and teddy bears for our children patients. And, um, you know, we'll give her a teddy bear. And if you're the driver of the ambulance that day and she's sitting up front, talk to her, you know, hey, what school do you go to? You know, what grade are you in? Uh, talk to her like that because she's not going to understand what's going on with her dad. And you don't want to, you don't want to, you know, talk to her like you would an adult. And then at the hospital, they will wait for another adult to come and then they will sit down and talk to the family together. The other thing you don't want to do is you guys will start learning vocabulary and you guys will start learning terms and abbreviations. So for instance, PPE BSI. In our world, that's personal protective equipment or it's body, uh, uh, safety isolation. Well, in our world, if I tell you, go get your PPE, you'll understand it. But if I tell a civilian, we had our PPE on and we're doing everything we can, they're not going to know what PPE is. They're going to say, what? What is PPE? So when you guys learn all of these fancy terms you're going to learn and all of these abbreviations, when you're speaking to families, just keep it simple and speak in plain language. Okay. The other thing that you can offer the daughter is it, it, it doesn't matter what religion you believe in. If you are religious, you can offer the chaplain to come out. Uh, chaplains are non-denominational, and they will assist every religion. Um, it, that's, a, that's an option if the family would like. And then you could also offer uh, counseling for the, for the family if that's, what, if that's what they need. And there's, there's avenues that we can, we can help them with. Without delaying patient transport, you briefly explained to the family member that upon your arrival, her father was not awake, was not breathing, and did not have a pulse. You explained that you have helped her, helped his heart to start beating again and are breathing for him, but that he is still unconscious. So again, we're given the facts, we're, cle we're keeping it in, in clear, concise language that they can understand. And then you explained that everything is being done to help him until he arrives at the hospital and doctors take over his care. So we're just being honest and, and we're telling the families, we'll meet you at the hospital. We're going to continue doing everything we can. She seems comforted by your kind words and professional demeanor and asked to travel with you to the hospital. That's absolutely fine. You assist her to the front of the ambulance and help her put on her seatbelt. The volunteer firefighter is trained to drive the emergency vehicles and offers to drive you and your partner to the hospital. So you and your partner are going to be in the back of the hospital and you're going to continue your assessments. You're going to continue with your um, care until you get to the hospital. The paramedic requests your help in the, in the patient compartment uh, because a full arrest call is an all hands on deck. So typically we will send three people minimum to the hospital during a full arrest. Two will be in the back. One will drive. Questions, comments, concerns? All right, what are some considerations for successful patient management during transport? So what, what do we want to continue to keep doing for this patient to make sure that the outcome is going to be good? Um, breathing. Excellent. So we're going to breathe for the patient if, if, if he's not breathing on his own. What else? Make sure the pulse is still there. Excellent. We're going to continue uh, checking for pulse. With a critical patient, we're going to, we're going to assess breathing and pulse every five minutes. So every five minutes, you're going to check those things. Good. What else? I know you guys haven't learned it yet, but what's something that we can start taking on this patient? Like giving him an IV. Okay, good. So the paramedic's going to start an IV. Checking vitals. Excellent. So we're going to check our vital signs. So you guys are going to learn how to do blood pressures, how to take the pulse, 
how to check for respirations. At this point, you're going to check a blood sugar. We're going to check his blood sugar to see what his blood sugar is because sometimes if they have a low blood sugar, that could cause heart problems. Um, and you guys are going to be trained on how to how to take how to check blood blood sugars. So um, you can do that. What else? Pretty much anything else the paramedic needs. You're you're the support for the paramedic. So um, you know you may have to still do compressions if you lose the pulse again. You may need to breathe. So there's a lot of things you need to be a good multitasker. That's the takeaway here. So you know you're gonna you're gonna continue assessing every five minutes all these things. So you know you're gonna be taking blood pressures every five minutes, checking for the pulse, checking respirations, and you're you're documenting all this as you go. So every five minutes. You're going to write down in your in your your journal what was the new blood pressure, what was the new pulse, what was the new respirations, is the pulse still present, and and all of this. Good. Wait, I got a question. Yeah. So you said every like doing all that stuff every five minutes. How long is a typical ambulance ride? Like, if someone were to let's say go into cardiac arrest at TCD, what 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 hospital would they go to? CDH or Good Sam in Downers Grove? So it's an excellent question. So two-part question you asked. I'll answer the first part first. The yeah. average time an ambulance spends on the scene of a full arrest is approximately 30 to 45 minutes. All right. So it takes us about 30 to 45 minutes from the time we arrive to do all those things. Mm -hmm. CPR, defibrillation, IV, airway. Um, then we get the patient in the back of the ambulance. We continue care. We drive to the hospital. So it's about 30 to 45 minutes. Um, your second part, the state statute is the patient has to go to the closest hospital during a true emergency. So full arrest is a true emergency. So if that were to happen here at TCD, the closest hospital from here is Glen Oaks Hospital. So that patient's going to be transported to Glen Oaks. Um, if you're if you're on the east side of Addison, you're going to go to either Glen Oaks or Elmhurst. If you're on the north side of Addison, you're going to either go to Glen Oaks or you're going to go to Alexian Brothers. So we have computers in our rigs, and the computer tells us which hospital is closest to where we are, and that's how we determine to go to the hospital. Now. If it is a non-life-threatening emergency, the patient has the right to choose which hospital they go they want to go to. So if the patient, say, has a possible broken leg, they may say, I would like to go to CDH. I would like to go to, to, to Good Samaritan. I'd like to go to uh, Alexian Brothers, Glen Oaks, Elmhurst. They can pick their hospital of choice. But if it's a if it's a true emergency, an unconscious person, they're going to the closest hospital. Good question. Any other questions? All right, minutes later, you arrive at the hospital. You and your partner have continued stabilizing the patient by reassessing the airway to confirm proper tube placement, providing additional medications as needed, and continuously monitoring the cardiac rhythm. So remember, we use the AED. EMR, EMT, AEMT, paramedic can use AED. However, the paramedic is going to continuously monitor with the, the cardiac monitor for the rhythm because they're trained at a higher level to be able to read those. And then you're just going to get the patient into the hospital, and then the nurses and doctor are going to continue care. One week later, you learn that the patient has made an impressive recovery and has been discharged from the hospital. He and his daughter later visit you and the other responders to express their thanks, and they bring you cookies, brownies, homemade treats for everybody to enjoy, which that, that's, that's real life. Um, you will have patients come visit you after you've resuscitated them, after they walk out of the hospital and have, and have survived that episode. Um, they're very grateful that you, you saved their life. So that's why you know this course is like none other that you're gonna take. It's like no other high school class that you take. This class deals with life-saving techniques. And you know, we are training you to be professional EMTs. Um, 
So you guys will see this. I will tell you, um, last year, when our students were doing their clinical time, if I didn't mention this already, we had eight of our students while doing their clinical time, whether it was in the hospital or on the ambulance, that were involved with resuscitative efforts. They performed CPR and they did compressions and breaths and they were able to uh, assist with defibrillation and they, they were involved in, in these kind of calls. Um, so you will see these kind of calls in your clinical settings. And then once you start working this summer, next summer, uh, next summer when you start working, you know, you will get calls like this. So you, you, we're, we are, we are going to get you with all the confidence, all the self-confidence and all the, the tools necessary to, to get you prepared for these kind of calls. Any other questions? All right, let's take a break here. Uh, let's go ahead and take a five minute break, stretch, get some coffee, and then um, there's a, a video that goes along with that lecture. Any questions, comments, rumors? A couple more minutes of break that I can answer or try to answer.
Anastasia. Yes. Cynthia. Yep. Eric. Yeah. Gianna. Yep. Justin. Here. Kyle. Hey, Lieutenant, it's me, Kevin. I don't know why my email is acting up right now. Ah, okay. And then uh, Lauren? Yep. And just, uh, I apologize up front. <laughs> Hernandez. Here. All right, so how do you say your first name? Jacqueline. Jacqueline. Got it. All right. Can you guys all see my screen? Yep. Yeah. Yes. All right. All right. So this video is kind of graphic. This video is not for the squeamish. However, you guys are going to be EMTs. So this is going to be your first video of a real life full arrest call. Okay, so just want to prepare you guys for what you're going to be able to see. You are going to see a live call in this scenario. This is going to go over everything we just talked about in our case study, but we're going to actually be able to watch it. Can you guys all hear the audio? Yeah. yeah. Okay, here we go. Yep. Starting with the 911 dispatch. Dispatch, what is the location of your emergency? Oh, wait, hold on. I can't see the video. Yeah, I think, I think you're sharing the, the wrong screen. Say again? Yeah, I think you're sharing the wrong screen. We can't see the video that you're trying to show us. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Let me, uh, let me change the... Can you see it now? Negative. No. Nope. Now we can. You see it now? Yeah. 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 All right. Let me know if you can hear the audio. I can hear it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me start this over. All right. Here we go. Dispatch, what is the location of your emergency? The location is 9023 Bell Court in Pine Grove Township. Okay, tell me exactly what happened. Well, my uh, father, he's rather old and he's just having trouble getting out of bed. Well, now, 595. We're right. And I was hoping that you could, you know, maybe send somebody over to help, uh, help me get him over to the bathroom. Okay. Are you with him now? Yes, I am. And how old is he, sir? He is 85. Is he awake? He is awake. Is he breathing? He is breathing. Okay. Uh, is he completely alert? In the virtual ride along series, we try to bring you real cases that help you translate classroom theory into actual clinical practice. Today's case illustrates some essential components of the EMS system and some key learning points that will help us save lives. We're gonna follow along with Jill and McKinsey. We were initially dispatched to a lift assist. The fire department had shown up prior to us. In this case, the fire department has been called to help somebody back into bed. That's why they call it a lift assist. Well, these calls can appear to be super simple and just no big deal, right? We're just putting somebody back into bed. And when they arrived, they saw that this patient was quite ill, so they requested us. Notice how assessment of this patient is complicated by very limited space in this bedroom. Okay. Now we know from the fire department and from the family that this patient is just too weak and unable to move. Doug, you can feel poke in your arm here. How are you doing, Doug? The crew is trying to figure out if there, in fact, is a further problem and the patient really needs to go to the hospital. And that's pretty evident right from the get-go. The patient was breathing, but it was pretty shallow. We're just going to roll you over a little bit. 
they need to move quickly to get the patient out of this environment, but there's not a lot of space to maneuver. Notice how they're putting the patient inside a sheet and using the sheet to carry the patient out. The patient's condition is changing very rapidly. How are you doing? And they have to react and begin treating the patient differently. Just a few minutes ago, the patient was breathing on their own just fine. And now, inside the ambulance, they're trying to figure out, is the patient still breathing on their own as well as they were before? No. So you see how they begin to escalate their care. So I'm just taking Open a guess. Open up your eyes. Right Can you breathe for me? Take a deep Anyone breath. Else? First with a non-rebreathing mask, administering additional oxygen, trying to get the patient's O2 sets up. And when that isn't working very well, they're going to switch to a back valve mask. Notice the masterful job that this firefighter is doing in managing the airway. He's actually holding the mask to form a great seal around the patient's face, kind of forming a C shape so to hold the mask, and an E shape with his fingers to pull the jaw up into the mask and form a good seal. Now, you'll also notice that after a few breaths, he gets his partner to come help him so that he can hold the bag and his partner can do a better job holding the seal, which is even more ideal. I want you to remember that these bag valve masks hold 1,500 milliliters of air. In fact, we need only 500 milliliters to actually get a breath in. With dead air space, we really only use 300 milliliters. If we squeeze the entire bag, that means we're giving the patient three times the amount of air that they actually need. So notice how careful they are to just give enough air to get chest rise. This patient is deteriorating rapidly. Their heart rate is slowing way, way down to the point where we might not even be able to detect the pulse. Medical research has actually taught us that there may be a pulse, but it's undetectable to our fingers or our instruments. And if you can't really feel it, then it's time to start compressions. <laughs> Chest compressions are hard to do well. It's very tiring. In fact, we want to switch compressors every two minutes to ensure that they're done properly. So McKinsey is going to start doing those compressions, but she needs relief really, really quickly. I had initiated chest compressions only about two minutes in. I was getting tired. Ready? One of the most important things, aside from knowing your protocols and knowing what to do, is trying to stay calm, which isn't always easy. Now here at Alina, we use a device, a mechanical CPR device called the Lucas device. There are others on the market and you should check into what your local area uses. The key to using a mechanical CPR device is that you cannot interrupt CPR for very long. So it's a coordinated approach. Think about pit crew CPR as everybody having a job. We try to interrupt CPR for less than 10 seconds. Anytime we're checking for a pulse or looking at rhythm, in this case, they did a great job of getting that device on very quickly. Yeah, we might be better after the change. Sometimes, using a mechanical CPR device can help make sure that chest compressions are delivered evenly and at the right rate, with the right depth, and the right release. So, the Lucas device that we have is really essential in um, getting good quality CPR and perfusion that brings them. Although today, we know chest compressions to be one of the most important elements of resuscitation. But it's really a constellation of therapies and procedures that make our resuscitation attempt actually work. Did you notice that the crew actually attach a rescue pod or impedance threshold device to the bag valve mask? What this device does, it prevents air from rushing in on the upstroke of a chest compression. So it's actually a circulatory device it's helping blood return back to the heart. Another nice feature of the rescue pod is that it has a timing light and therefore guides us into how often we should ventilate. So every time the light goes off is when they squeeze the bag. As soon as possible, after establishing great compressions and getting an airway in, this crew is looking to insert a more advanced airway. 
Now they know that the patient vomited earlier, and so they're concerned that the patient may vomit again. While compressions are ongoing, they're going to insert a king airway. This is done very well and very quickly and can be done while compressions are still ongoing. In fact, most of our airway management can be done while CPR is still ongoing. After insertion of the king airway, they have to confirm that it's in the right spot. So you see Jill immediately listening to the stomach. That's the first place we want to listen, just in case we're in the wrong spot and air is entering the stomach. We want to identify that immediately. And in this case, she does. For some reason, this particular placement, which is through no fault of the crew, has ended up in a wrong spot, and it's giving us air entering the stomach. It is never going to be the same thing twice. Expect the unexpected, because it won't always go exactly as planned. Notice how, after a few ventilations, stomach contents have begun to come up through the tube. Not only is this a bad sign, but it also can impede the functioning of the ITD or the rescue pod. So upon noticing that, we immediately have to take action, and this crew is doing that. After removing the rescue pod, deflating the cup, removing the king airway, it's going to be super important that this patient gets suction, so we clear the airway again before we give a breath. Now we can return to some basic airway maneuvers with some simple adjuncts to make sure that we're ventilating the patient, reoxygenating before we attempt another airway. You ready for a vaso? Yep. Okay. If you could just mark your time. Yeah. Um, yeah. 10.22 vasos in. 10.22, thank you. Yep. When you're inserting a nasal airway, you may find that there is resistance. Gently put pressure on the airway, advancing it past whatever it is that it's caught up on. If you encounter great resistance, then you want to stop because it might be up against some sort of polyp or turbinate or something that might cause bleeding. In this case, notice how they're gently twisting the airway and because it's properly lubricated, it's going to pass through without a problem. Remember how patients don't really read the textbook and they don't present like they're supposed to? Well, this patient had an unusual amount of stiffness to their airway and to their neck. We don't really know why. When the crew identified that, they knew they had a difficult airway. One of the tools available to us at Alina is a video laryngoscope. Video laryngoscopy, as it's called, is not a very common procedure today in EMS. In our particular version of the tool, we have a connector that goes into the same computer we use for electronic charting. It's just a USB port. It turns our entire laptop into a screen. We use video scope intubation, which is a really helpful tool um, with someone who has some secretions. Notice, as they begin to insert the laryngoscope, we begin to get a very clear view of the airway anatomy. This is rare footage, and we're going to have an opportunity to talk about some very unique and very special structures that are essential to identify when we're doing endotracheal intubation. Notice first how we see the epiglottis. That's the large or a hat that you see, that structure that covers up the trachea. This device lifts that without actually having to line up the planes of the airway. As we advance the tube, we begin to see the structures bouncing up and down from the chest compressions. It's really normal, especially during mechanical CPR, we can take our time and look and see where exactly that tube needs to go. Notice how you can begin to see the vocal cords. On the upstroke of the compression, we have a much clearer view of those. Notice what's happening as Jill begins to advance the tube through the glottic opening, trying to get it through the vocal cords. She's inadvertently picked up a part of the epiglottis, so she has to back off. McKinsey is appropriately asking that she consider removing the stylet. Oh, pull the stylus out. I need that. It's still really tight. Now, helpful suggestions like this, especially when they relate to safety, are key and they're part of our crew resource management techniques. When she removed the stylet, she's now got a much more flexible tube. 
as the tube begins to advance now, it will pass through the cords. Notice the pool of fluid, possibly stomach contents or blood, that is accumulated right underneath the airway. It's not obstructing our view in this case, but it's something to keep in mind because we could suction that out once we get the airway secured. Hey, Beth. I'm seeing chest rise. Breath 24. Good. Breath. Okay. Good. Let's pop on that end title, please. Yep. Once that tube is through the cords, okay. Okay. we have a few confirmatory steps that are critical before the procedure is finished. The first is to again listen to the stomach, make sure that no air is going in, make sure we have lung sounds, and of course, attach an end tidal CO2 detector, which in this case is attached to our EKG monitor. Once all of those are done, we can make sure that there's good pulse oximetry, that we get a reading from the end tidal CO2. I so to below the, below, below the rescue pod, by the way. There you go. You are. We're also going to record the depth of the endotracheal tube, how far we had to insert it, so that if it moves up or down, we'll know that there was a change. It's usually a marking on the tube that shows 22 to 24 or 25 centimeters. Are you good? Do you want to get going? See, yeah. Okay. I'll take Gary with me. Jill is using a commercially available endotracheal tube holder to attach that tube and make sure it's secured so it doesn't move. Another technique is to find a cervical collar and place it on the patient. Even though there's no cervical injury, it helps us prevent movement forwards and backwards so that the tube doesn't become dislodged. Reassessment of lung sounds anytime you're moving or have moved the patient is key. The tube can get dislodged. So you can see Jill is double checking to make sure everything is where it's supposed to be. Things have now settled down during the transport and the first responder is able to tell us a little bit more about what the scene was like before the crew arrived. So initial presentation, mm -hmm. lights were down on the bed, he was partly dressed, and he was looking around, but he never gave us a time of proof. Okay. So, the radio this... pulses were poor, and I couldn't get a radio pulse, so I lifted up his leg, and he called him for a radio emergency. Okay. And uh, once I lifted his legs up, then I could get a radio and I got that. Gotcha. Of course, notifying the hospital is another key element, as always. And Jill here is alerting them that the cardiac arrest is not improving. So they know they have a patient who is asystolic. We are coming to you code three with the cardiac arrest. He's in asystole. We um, have been doing CPR. So this is pretty much witness in cardiac arrest. His son called this morning because he was unresponsive. He's breathing um, when fire first got there, but um, unresponsive. Uh, we had him out to the ambulance and uh, lost his pulse. We started CPR. We've given him one epi, one vaso. Um, we do have him two intubated. And we should be you folks, um, I'm guessing, about five to eight minutes. We have one IV that was established in the arm, which is how the crew has been giving medications. It's always good to establish a second IV on any critical patient. In this case, Jill is going to use an intraosseous line for that second access point. Notice how quickly and easily these can be inserted. In fact, check your local guidelines. Your medical director may want you to insert the IO first and an IV secondarily. As we approach the hospital, if you have time, it's good to begin to look around and make sure that we're ready to unload the patient. Oftentimes, cords can get tangled up in the middle of a cardiac arrest, and it's important to make sure you understand what devices are coming with you, what devices are staying in the ambulance, what cords might be wrapped around the stretcher or the oxygen or the EKG machine so that nothing gets accidentally ripped out. It is really common in your initial cardiac arrest to have such chaos 
that IV lines get ripped out, endotracheal tubes get ripped out. And when that happens, you have to start over. That's terrible for patient care. So taking an extra second to be smooth. Remember, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Are you going in with the monitor or just disconnecting? Um, I think we got enough hands. We can go in with the monitor. If there was any chance of this patient surviving, and there's always that hope, that chance, this crew was the right crew. They were prepared. They responded appropriately when they had a very difficult airway. They handled themselves masterfully and provided the best care that anyone could provide under very difficult circumstances. We're gonna try and bring the monitor in here too. So as we were pulling him out of the ambulance, once we got to the hospital, there was lots of cords. There's lots of things that can't be moved and touched and pulled. I ended up taking that IV line and moving it down by his feet because that's where the you know fewer amount of cords were and nobody's gonna trip up on it. Um, how long has it been? Oh, sorry, the time. Um, well, 10, uh, 15 was when we gave the uh, epi, so. I want you to be psychologically, emotionally prepared for what happens during a cardiac arrest in the field. It is very chaotic, especially those first few that really can catch you off guard. And since most of these end in death, we need to prepare for the next steps after that occurs. In this case, we transported the patient to the hospital, but most often we will cease resuscitation measures on scene. If you can go out there and stay calm in the midst of this type of chaos and things not working exactly like they should, you will stand a much better chance of making that impact and saving a life. And after all, that is why we're here. All right, so what do you guys think? I need to go bring in the Lucas device. <laughs> <laughs> so that's now you, you kind of just get a quick overview of, um, you know, why this is not your typical course. You know, this is this is real, real deal here. Um, and like I said, I had eight of our students last year were involved with resuscitative efforts and did exactly what we just saw. They were uh, they were in with the team and, uh, and performing that. So yeah, you know the, the the equipment is all state of the art nowadays. Um, you know in Addison we have the uh, we don't have the Lucas device, but but we do have um, our device that that does compressions. You know for us on uh, on our ambulances we carry portable ventilators so you saw the firefighter was was actually breathing for the person um, we have devices that will will, will do that for us um, but we still have to be critical thinkers we still have to be multitaskers and um, you know we, we still need to be professionals so just a little overview on what you guys are going to be learning and, and doing uh, for the rest of the day we're, we're going to break here uh, for the rest of today, please continue working on your homework. Homework is due by tomorrow. And then um, please get logged into the JB Learning, uh, get into the Navigate, and then your quiz is up and ready to go. Um, the quiz is uh, open till tomorrow at midnight. If we need to extend it, we will. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Lieutenant Danelli will be here tomorrow. All right, hearing uh, no other questions, I appreciate you guys attending today, and you guys have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Lieutenant. Yes. 
when would you like me to possibly turn in that uh, uh, explorer sheet for you? So our next meeting is going to be September 8th. It's a Tuesday. If you can attend that from 6 to 9, you can bring the paperwork then. Okay. And I'll, uh, I'll remind your dad that the 8th is going to be the next meeting. All right. Yeah, I think I have it down on my calendar. I was just wondering if you wanted me to turn it in sooner or whatnot. No, that's fine. You can bring it on the 8th. And then um, also, you should have got the email from Miss um, uh, Lorido. Uh, yes, the new uh, yep. service. Yep. Yeah, so she's uh, she's here, whatever you need, um, you know, for, for help. And then um, if you need help getting into the JB Learning, she can help you with that too. So don't don't hesitate to reach out, okay? All right. All right. You have a good rest of your day. You too. All right. Bye now. Bye.